Human beings love awards. We love being awarded for our contributions. In fact, we love watching other people receive awards. A Tony, an Oscar, a Great British Bake Off cake stand and flowers, whatever. But the truth is, winning is hard. So here's a pro tip. Did you know you can just go on Amazon right now and buy yourself a trophy? $8.99 and you'll have a 10 inch gold star. If you buy it now, if you have Prime, it'll be at your doorstep tomorrow or in COVID time six months from now. For a dollar more, you can get one that says first place right on it. In fact, for the low price of $13.97, you can buy a 12 pack of gold trophies. And at that point, you can put one or two in every room of your house. Imagine an award in your bathroom. That's winning. But you wouldn't do that, would you? Why? Because it isn't about the physical object. It's about the story it tells. And without a backstory of triumph or hard work, it's just a cheap piece of plastic painted gold. Symbols tell stories. And these stories have the power to shape our perception of ourselves and of the world around us. What if I told you that your life right now is worth noticing? This is the Attention Collection. I'm Anthony Garcia. The story of the rise of the global superpower that is McDonald's is a fascinating one. A small, independently owned hamburger operation in San Bernardino, California, grows to be an international household name. Since its sleepy beginnings in 1954, McDonald's has sold more than 100 billion burgers. It has since gone on to launch more than 36,000 locations worldwide. But how is this American dream turned reality even possible? The answer is a name. Ray Kroc. Ray Kroc was a milkshake machine salesman. That was a thing. And he was driving around the country looking for restaurants to sell to. And he stumbled upon this little burger spot ran by two brothers, Dick and Mac McDonald. Which, by the way, Mac McDonald? Classic name. And he was blown away by their operation. And so he pitches them on franchising. And then he starts a corporation, and then he bought the whole company six years later. The rest is history. At least that's what it says on the McDonald's website. The real story is a little more complicated than that. In the film The Founder, Michael Keaton plays Ray Kroc. And the story of Kroc's legacy becomes a lot more three-dimensional in this film. For me, the most powerful scene in the movie is where Croc's character first pitches the Brothers McDonald on the dream of expansion. It's a dramatization, for sure, but wow does it draw you in. Croc launches into this speech about driving through small towns all across the country. And the towns were different, obviously, but they all had two things in common. They had a courthouse and they had a church. On top of the church, got a cross, and on top of the courthouse, that have a flag. Flags, crosses, crosses, flags. Driving around, I just cannot stop thinking about this tremendous restaurant. Now, at the risk of sounding blasphemous, forgive me. Those arches have a lot in common with those buildings. A building, well, a cross on top of it, what is that? It's a gathering place where decent, Wholesome people come together and they, they share values protected by that American flag. It could be said that that beautiful building flanked by those arches signifies more or less the same thing. It doesn't just say delicious hamburgers inside. 
They signify family. It signifies community. It's a place where Americans come together to break bread. I am telling you, McDonald's can be the new American church. The cross, the flag, the golden arches. Symbols. The conversation didn't really happen this way, but if you do even a little research, it holds up. McDonald's golden arches is one of the most iconic symbols in history. It's known the world over, and it transcends language and culture, but still somehow conveys America, because it conveys possibility, the, quote, American dream. It shapes culture. It shows that anything is possible with hard work and ingenuity. But if you look a little closer at the arches, you start to see the cracks. The truth is, Ray Kroc saw an opportunity and he pounced. He sold the McDonald's brothers on a vision and then slowly forced them out of their own business by starting his own corporation with their name, buying the land that each franchise sat on and then eventually pushed them into selling the entire business for $2.7 million. That's not pennies, but it's a fraction of what McDonald's was and would be worth. He even referred to himself as the founder of McDonald's. Imagine that. Your last name is McDonald. You started a business with your brother and a strong work ethic. You design a system that revolutionizes food production, and then some milkshake salesman takes the place over and calls himself the founder. We don't go eat at Croc Donald's. On the McDonald's website right now, under a heading entitled, The Legend Lives On, it says Ray Kroc's legacy continues to be an inspirational and integral part of McDonald's, today and into the future. This story is painted onto the golden archers that you and I recognize immediately. Stories shape symbols, and then symbols shape us. But what if it's only half the story? And what if we are being shaped by an incomplete or downright fictional story? Statues are being torn down all across the United States right now. Christopher Columbus, George Washington, General Robert E. Lee, statues are being beheaded. They're literally being ripped off their pedestals. People are tagging them with graffiti. And while some are cheering about this, others are beside themselves with anger. These statues are national symbols. They represent our story. They stand as a testament to progress. Why would people want to remove them? President Donald Trump recently said that protesters are trying to, quote, wipe out our history. He said their goal is to overthrow the American Revolution. Others are saying, although our history isn't perfect, we can't erase it. And they see statue removal as a function of erasing history. But is that what statues are for? Preserving our historical memory? Are they there simply to make sure we don't forget what happened before you and I were born? Well, here's a statement from the Executive Order on Building and Rebuilding Monuments to American Heroes on the White House website, the official website. It says, because the past is always at risk of being forgotten, monuments will always be needed to honor those who came before. Since the time of our founding, Americans have raised monuments to our greatest citizens. It's important to pay attention to language. In other words, statues are like permanent trophies on display for all to see. They are public celebration of our greatest achievers. They are monuments to superheroes, basically. In fairness, 
the executive order does acknowledge that these heroes are flawed. And there's a call issued to incorporate statues that depict better representatives of this country. But what does it communicate to past, present, and future generations to have a national symbol dedicated to someone like Christopher Columbus, for instance? A known murderous rapist, enslaver, and abusive colonizer who accidentally discovered land that was already discovered and very much inhabited and wreaked havoc. When we insist upon memorializing such a figure, what does that say about the kind of society we want to shape? The history of cruelty led and orchestrated by Columbus goes beyond the category of flaw. He was a monster. And while I agree we need to remember his legacy as a cautionary tale and a heart-wrenching example of our not-so-humble beginnings, we certainly don't need to honor his life. We don't need a statue, a song, or a holiday to remember his legacy of terror. To my knowledge, and I could be wrong, Germany has zero statues of Hitler, and yet they seem to have no trouble remembering the stains he and his adherents left on their history. Jewish people certainly have no trouble remembering. In my opinion, and this is a solo podcast, so that's what you're here for, we shouldn't be asking why some statues are coming down. We should be asking why they were ever put up in the first place. What images do we want people to hold on to when they think about us? Which symbols and flags do we want to tell our story? Our symbols need not represent perfection. If they did, they wouldn't represent us. But they should at least represent our aspirations. They should inspire us forward. The executive order that I referenced a moment ago also goes on to say, these statues are silent teachers in solid form of stone and metal. That is about as true as it gets. Our symbols transcend language and even conscious thought. They form us without so much as a whisper working in the background of our minds. And for this reason, we must choose them very carefully. Which symbols occupy space in our homes? Which flags do we fly in our neighborhoods? Which structures tell our stories? These symbols have a part in our formation, and they form generations coming up after us. My children have never had a McDonald's hamburger. They've never snacked out on Chicken McNuggets. But almost every time we drive by a location and see the golden arches, they say, there's McDonald's. They don't know about the 100 billion burgers sold or the sordid legacy of Ray Kroc. But they know this symbol is somehow significant. They know it is supposed to stand for something. That's formative. 